Hey, welcome to Optimizing Canine Performance. I've uh, spent a good part of my life uh, working with athletic and working dogs, uh, from the bird dogs to uh, retrievers, to raising and racing greyhounds, to uh, my time at uh, working with military dogs. It's been a great opportunity to um, interact with all these dogs. What's really cool about it is I've met a lot of great people over the, over the years, um, it's uh, just an honor to work with all of them. Um, this is kind of an introductory slide about myself. I uh, um, had uh, Ben was my bird dog and Adrian was my retriever uh, growing up. Um, had a great interest in um, how uh, uh, dogs worked and how to uh, work with them. And it was really neat uh, when I began uh, working with the racing greyhound. I realized how finely tuned these elite athletes were, and um, started uh, at the University of Kansas uh, researching how to uh, reduce injuries. But it fell into a world of where I actually um, found a greater interest in how to optimize their performance. Uh, later on, uh, I got the opportunity to work with the military dogs and detection dogs. Um, and that's a whole other area of uh, um, performance. Um, uh, you include the special senses, the, the olfactory ability, the sight, all the things that come with that. I spent uh, well, 30 years in my 60 years uh, doing research in ways to optimize uh, canine performance which is great because it's not only optimizing performance, but it's reducing injuries, it's reducing sickness and uh, exercise uh, related medical issues. Um, I began my little career uh, hunting dogs or hunting birds in western Kansas. Um, ducks in the morning, um, pheasants on the way back to lunch, where and then we'd move on to quail in the afternoon until the, the geese flew out at the firing line. So there's a lot of different things we'd see uh, in, in the bird dogs out there in western Kansas. Later on, as I got more involved in the, uh, the performance animals, um, we saw different ways that nutrients, uh, nutrition and supplements would uh, enhance or benefit the, the performance of the dogs. Um, and then I got the opportunity to move down to the southeastern part of the United States and was working with flock sounds. and. I actually got introduced to sled dogs during that time where we uh, did a lot of uh, interesting physiological studies, uh, conditioning studies, how to uh, enhance the ability of the dog to perform their activity. This all led to uh, um, a request from uh, uh, where the, I was asked would there be a way that we could apply these same methodologies to the, uh, the uh, military working dogs. And we developed uh, some ultra conditioning programs that helped them to perform their tasks. A side um, uh, benefit from that was I realized um, we could develop um, training conditioning programs that would uh, reduce the potential for injury and reduce the potential for sickness or illness in these dogs. And it comes right down to it. Uh, if you've got a performance dog or an athletic dog, the last thing you want to do is see a veterinarian, or the last thing you want to do is have your dog broken down or sick. So I started adapting these programs into a preventative um, program. One of the things that's kind of interesting is that working dogs or dogs have been working with man since uh, a long time. Let's call it that. Um, they were our protectors. They helped us hunt. They helped us herd. Certainly over the past... Uh, 20, 50 years, um, our world has changed from a frontier farm-based society uh, to more of an urbanized landscape. But that's one thing that hasn't changed, and that's the dog's perception. Um, they still want to, to do whatever they can to uh, interact and, and assist and, and, and work with their best friend, the human. So it's, in reality, it's a working partnership. The dog is still driven to work and interact with the, the man, with, with the human, um, they're an honorable party, they're loyal, the obedient, and the trainable. 
it's just uh you know the more i work with these guys and gals that are the dogs in the dog world um the more i have a greater respect for what they're doing and, and how they and how they can help us how they can help the world this led to um, the science of canine performance in that world uh, performance science is all based on how can we optimize all the metabolic systems, the structural capacity, the mental state of the dog, so that when they're performing their tasks, um, there's minimal stress placed upon the body. Um, in addition to that, if we've got dogs who are going to perform tasks like uh, scent or um, uh, behavior types of activities, we want to make sure that they're able to do that at their base abilities, their base best abilities. So it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, area of, of, of uh, science. I've enjoyed every moment I've been in it and I uh, will we'll continue to do that. I think the first thing we have to do is recognize the athleticism of the dog. Um, you understand the whole body's involved in performance. Um, when a greyhound comes out of the box and takes off, 99% of the muscles are being used to an extreme extent. And then when you get into the, the more endurance breeds, the muscles are still being used, but it's more of an endurance activity. There's cardio effects, there's uh, a nutrition, there's um, all kinds of different things that will come to play a role because it's a longer period of time the dogs are performing their effort. That also means that the longer period of time they're performing their effort, the greater chance they have of injury or sickness. Now, if we think of uh, an application of the elite athletes, well, it also applies to most uh, daily activities of the working dog. Here you see a border collie. Uh, his job is to move the cattle from one field to another field. And in this case, he's sprinting, he's turning, he's slowing down, he's speeding up, accelerating, decelerating. And then he's got to say, okay, you know, I need you to move. Just move just a little bit. Well, it's a different kind of communication between a dog and the animal that they're working with. In this case, the, 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 the cow is not sure it wants to move. But this uh, border collie has to understand, or the, has to make that cow understand this is what they're going to do. So all these different activities that the dogs perform, um, if we prepare them proper, properly, we minimize or reduce any potential for risk of injury, any potential for risk of medical-related injuries or problem, uh, imp impairments or problems. Once we understand the factors that do this, we can also t take that and we'll develop a, a training program to optimize the abilities of the dog and reduce those problems. So, it's kind of basic, um, but it's very complex. In this sense, we say what we want to do, our goal, is to enhance all the positive forces that result in an optimal workout performance. Once we identify all those uh, forces, we want to recognize, okay, what are the things that are going to hold us back? Well, those are certainly our distractive forces, things inside the dog that may have a problem, uh, different low-level diseases, disease processes, or things going on, unconditioning, fatigue, or outside things. Is it too sunny? Is it hot? Is it cold? Different things that would affect the, us from achieving our, our goal. Once we identify those negative factors, we can say, what can we do to reduce those negative factors and enhance the positive factors? <clears throat> now, in this talk, I'm talking about um, athletic dogs, working dogs, but this also applies to any dog. Any dog can uh, it benefits from a conditioning program. Um, the more the dog works, the better the body's ready to handle the, the activities of, of a day. Well, some of these dogs are in a competitive world, <clears throat> and so you have to understand performance potential. <clears throat> a dog's athletic potential for an event or task is by, based upon the inherited potential within, with which it is born. In this slide, you see four different types of dogs, a retriever, a greyhound, a pointer, and a sled dog. Uh, now, if you think of some of these other dogs, I don't know that the greyhound could go to ground to get a rat like the rat terrier could. So potential is just based upon the potential related to the task it's going to perform. So our management program should be designed to allow the dog to perform at its maximum potential. The performance ex expectations should not exceed the dog's ability. And I see this very often when someone's brought a dog into me and it's obvious the dog will not 
is not designed to perform the activity the dog's been participating in. That leads to a discussion with the owner or handler about what would be good things for that dog. Are there alternative activities <coughs> where that dog could participate? So when we talk about personal performance potential by each dog, we have to understand it's, it's a personal performance, not a competitive performance, or I would say not a comparative performance. So in this case, we might have a, rabbit, a Labrador Retriever who has phenomenal bloodlines and genetics, but never performs the tasks that those genetics would be related to. That's more of a companion animal. So in a sense, that dog may achieve an optimal 50% of the potential of what they're going to do. An active dog um, may be a weekend warrior or, or participate in different things during the week. Again, if it's not participating in the specific activities that dog is bred for, it may never achieve potential, uh, the, the full potential of its performance abilities. A working dog certainly is more close uh, to reaching that type of potential, but a lot of times the conditioning and, and training programs don't necessarily take it out to its full physiological component. Most of where you see the dogs reach their full potential is in the competitive sports whether it's greyhound racing, sled dog racing, or other uh, competitive activities, <coughs> that's where you'll see the best, um, the most percent, highest percentage of performance potential met. Now, what about our career performance goals? Well, most activities by dogs, they don't go out and compete one time and they're done. They're going to compete over many, year, or many times over a year and then for many years. Uh, you'd like to have your dog perform or work with you as long as they can. If it's uh, your retriever and he's your partner and your buddy and your hunting buddy, um, certainly he, cre he creates this long-lasting bond. And the longer that that dog is able to perform, the, la the longer that your relationship with this dog can, can continue. Related to that, you'd like to be able to perform its top ability the whole time it is performing during this. So certainly our goal should be to not push the dog past its abilities, but allow that dog's abilities to perform for the whole of its life. Um, so that it's not stressed out so much in its later, latter years. Now sometimes performance is based on comparative performance, and that's not really fair to the dog. In this example we have, um, it's what could be designed for an upset where you have a dog who is highly bred for a certain specific activity. Its training was, was set up in line and, and all ready to go. Competing against two dogs who did not quite have that um, inherited potential. But for some reason, the dog that has the high potential has something happens prior to the competition or before the race. Maybe up, it was up all night uh, being uh, transported from one area to another, or maybe uh, the dog next to it was barking all night, it didn't get night sleep, but when it goes out and competes at this one per performance time, it is nowhere near its potential. Next to it are two dogs competing well above their, almost to their highest potential. Now their inherited potential isn't as great, but because that one point in time, their um, performance, they, they, they perform so close to their, their potential that they could actually overcome and defeat the dog that has the, um, the better potential, the inherited potential. Now, in that sense, this is comparative performance. In reality, when we're working with a dog or an athletic dog or a working dog, we only want to focus on um, how that dog's done within, its, within itself. In other words, Let's always work for its personal best. Now, another thing that happens is duration of performance. Um, certainly, in, uh, in any sprinting activity, uh, fly ball, uh, greyhound racing, there is a point that fatigue is going to set in because these dogs are performing at super maximal output. <coughs> so, certainly, what I'm talking about here does apply to the sprint breeds, but in reality, we're talking mostly here about endurance performance. In other words, can we allow our dog to perform at its full percentage, or its full optimum ability for the longest period of time? Um, a big drive or a big problem here is fatigue. Now, fatigue could be um, uh, 
the dog's not conditioned properly, maybe they're not being fed properly, maybe there's an underlying problem. All these things can play a role, and so that's why we want to design our whole program around optimizing the ability of the dog to perform. So then we need to understand what are the things that dogs do. Now, this is a very complicated slide. I used to give it to my students many years ago, and, and I could spend 20, 30 minutes just talking about this slide alone. But in reality, dogs, when they do things, go from point A to point B. So the red line there, if we're talking about a straight sprint, the dog points, starts from point A and begins, uh, runs straight till it gets to point B. Um, a lot of times those are sprint activities. We could also throw the power events in there. Um, certainly a lot of bite work, aggression work is a, an all out super maximal effort. Um, so sprint and power exercises are typically um, super maximal outputs. Now some dogs uh, go from point A to B, uh, they may move somewhere, let's think about the retriever. The retriever runs out and it comes back. Um, so in other words, point A is actually point B and then point A again. Uh, as, as you start to go to longer distances, uh, you become more of an endurance event. So we think about the sled dogs, the, the bird dogs who are working for hours on end. Um, those now become, and typically when they're, they're working, they're working for longer than two minutes and the performance intensity is less than 90% of their aerobic power. No matter what the dog's doing, whether it's sprint power or endurance, the dog is using all of its body. The muscles certainly are involved, the skeleton's involved, the nervous system's involved, the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, the GI tract, the renal, hormonal, skin, and all the special senses. <clears throat> now, if the dog's having to detect or do some other type of um, like hearing or whatever it's got to do within its activity, now it, be, it needs to be able to form that task from point A to point B and, and be able to still optimize its detection or special senses. So we go back to that slide again. What we want to do is get all the, do everything we can to prepare the positive forces to perform the optimal task and minimize or eliminate any of the negative forces. So, what we're looking at here is maximize the performance of the body. The body is what carries the dog around. Now, if there's a detection system involved, let's say, let's say they're having to smell things or identify things or think about things. For example, a retriever going out there has to think about where and remember where they saw the dog go down or where the bumper came down. So there's a lot of thought processes going down there. If it's a blind retrieve where they don't know where it came down, there's a that even that actually increases the amount of thought processes or activity that the, that, the, that the mind is having to think through. Now that's more of a mental stress upon the dog. It can actually have an effect on the physiology. But the big part of this is that the body uh, is moving the dog around. In that red circle, the cardiovascular system, the, the endurance capacity of the dog has to be there. And so what we look at this and okay, what are, could we group the factors that we got to think about into three categories? We call it P3 conditioning. The physical capacity of the dog, that's the muscles and the bones. The physiological capacity or metabolism of the dog, that's able to be able to, to have those muscles do what they got to do without fatiguing the dog. And then the psychological component. That's the, the mind, the mental state. So let's just think of that, okay, the three P's, physical, physiological, and psychological, and then certainly there's special sensory performance. We don't, if the dog is a detection dog, we want to make sure that that doesn't decline during the, the performance. <clears throat> now, there's another thing I want to mention here is that um, a lot of times there's a difference between preparation and maintenance. If the dog has not participated in this activity and you're beginning to or introducing the dog to the sport or to the effort, now we're developing the systems to work together. Once they get up to a certain state, now we're maintaining them. So the design of the system may be different in preparation versus maintenance. So those are the factors that are going to play a big role in the internal factors of the dog. Now, what are the things that are going to work against us? 
Well, we go back to those three P's again. The structural is typically pain is going to hurt. It's going to affect the dog's ability to move around and be active. Fatigue is the other one that's going to affect the physiological activity. And certainly drive or fear is what's going to affect the psychological components of performance. So they really go hand in hand, the yin, yin and yang of this thing, where you've got a physical structure doing what it's got to do. The physiology's got to, we're trying to enhance how it can perform. And then we want to make sure the dog's in the right mental state to handle all this. These are the three things that are going to work against us. So what we want to do is understand their role in it so that we can minimize how they affect it. What I found is that what I want, there is dogs that could be affected and perform great and the performance is phenomenal and you don't really know that there's something going under there. Now at some point a problem can get to, to a, a, a large enough a level that it can affect the ability of the dog. What I think is important for anyone who's working with these dogs is to reduce the potential for the performance to be affected. The sooner that you can identify a problem or that you can insert something that can pre prevent the problems, the better. A lot of times, you know, there's, so I've classified into five different grades. Number one is an asymptomatic problem. Two is a symptomatic, but, perf but performance is unaffected. Three is symptomatic and the performance is affected. Or four, the, the incident or effort or the problem is so bad that it's performance inhibiting. And certainly there's number five, career ending. What I have found in my experience is that the most, m more often than not, the veterinarian is seeing a dog's um, at stage four, performance inhibiting. I think it's very important that we recognize these levels before that performance po point or the inhibiting point and address them as best we can. That falls back on the handler or dog owner to recognize these things and then to and that's what I'm really trying to get at with this presentation is how to identify these things early so that you can work with a veterinarian or someone who's uh, um, educated in this area to address the problems there. I found in my career when I can find catch the problems in those first three grades, it's phenomenal how the, 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 the dog's performance um, maintains itself better, um, actually enhanced performance, and the career's longer. From a musculoskeletal standpoint, and that's where mo a lot of times this, this will play a role, you have the same gradations. You have asymptomatic, symptomatic but performance unaffected, symptomatic and performance affected, performance inhibiting, career ending. What I really would like to do is to introduce the handler and owner to identify things when they're low level problems um, so you can address them early uh, and so that they never surface as a larger problem. What I found is by addressing this and this, the result is we minimize or reduce the potential for injury, and we minimize and reduce the potential for medical issues. At the same time, we're optimizing performance of the dog, which is really what our op ultimate goal is. I just want to introduce you here in this presentation to some common structural issues that can then pop up. Certainly, distal extremity issues of the dog are, are, are um, issues that we don't commonly understand or see. Something that I've seen quite often in dogs be a, a low-level factor that um, wasn't picked up before. And what I mean that is um, we're talking about the toes, we're talking about the carpus, the tarsus, and the muscles. And in this slide, what I wanted to introduce was we forget a lot of times that the muscles the origin of the muscles are either at the stifle or the elbow, and then the tendons run down and attach to the toes. So you could have a problem associated with the distal extremity that is really more of a muscle problem, but it, you can't identify it until you palpate or feel the, the muscle origins around the elbow and the, or the stifle. Uh, toe problems are very common, as is carpal problems. I just want to introduce this to you because one of the things that's common to all dogs, regardless of the sport they're participating in, is that the, the dog goes through a, a stride cycle. 
the back legs come down um, the front and the, and the front leg is lifted up the front end is lifted up until the dog comes up in the air and comes back down on the front legs then they go in through the front uh, flight cycle till the back legs come down again a study we did a long time ago uh, showed that the most important muscles or the muscles that tend to fatigue first are the back muscles and so what I've identified over the years is that um, there's a large um, component of back muscles. They can affect performance and no one's really thinking about it. If you if you come from a personal standpoint or you approach from a personal standpoint, I don't know how many days that you may or I know I do will get up in the morning and I have my back sore or in the afternoon my back sore. I don't run somewhere and say, oh my gosh, I gotta have my back x-rayed and MRI because my back sore. My back sore. It's usually muscles. And um, you know, I, dogs have the same thing. They just don't have a way to show us. And so that's why I just want to introduce this area, the, the, the lower back, the, the lumbar muscles, the hip area as key components to performance of any dog. <clears throat> so you can actually see impediments to speed. You can see jumping issues. You can have um, just working issues all related to the, to the lumbosacral or, or lower back muscles uh, of the dogs. And that's why I want to introduce um, th that image here that's shown here is the, the muscles on top of the, of the vertebra are what actually lifts the front of the body up. Um, if you have muscle soreness in the lower back, it's going to cause abnormal movement of the, of the body. It can predispose to uh, front, in, front, front limb injuries. It can be all kinds of different things. Um, I found that once we recognize these things right off the bat, there's many ways you can address it through um, medical regimens, uh, therapeutic laser, e -STEM. These are all ways to um, address these, I could call subclinical or low level, maybe two or grade two or three uh, structural issues just through therapy. And you'll actually see an improvement in the dog. These are not injuries. This is just back soreness. And that's, I wanted to introduce this because it's a key component to performance. <clears throat> on, on the other side of that is how would I prepare a dog so that their back muscles or their this, this uh, propulsion energy of the body um, is, is prepared to handle the rigors of work and reduce or minimize or eliminate the potential for back soreness. Well, there's all kinds of activities we can do for that. It's typically an action that where the back legs are going to lift the front end up. And if we understand that stride length and stride frequency are the two major components of, uh, of running, stride frequency is affected by fatigue. So things that we can do to, in, to increase the strength or increase the, cardio, uh, the endurance capacity of those uh, vertebral muscles we're going to reduce the chance of fatigue, which then um, enhances performance and reduces the potential for injury or metabolic problems. For example, uphill work, hurdles, tight distances, wet sand sprints, those are things that can increase the energy, or sorry, the strength, the capacity, metabolic capacity of the lower back and, and the muscles of the hip. Other ways to enhance the strength or the, uh, the ability of the front end, the toes and the carpus, is circular activity. Um, large, large circles, loping speeds. Uh, those are things that can actually put low stresses upon the front end of the body and reduce the potential for injury. I hate to bring it up, but sand work is, if done correctly, can actually um, enhance the strength of the toes and the muscles and the tendons in the, in the, in the distal extremity. There's two things, um, two theories, theorems, uh, uh, Wolf's Law and Davis's Law related to uh, forces placed upon the body will create uh, an action that, that strengthens the body to handle those forces if they're done at, at the right level and not, and not too, I mean, not too much that you create strain. Um,
So I just want to introduce you to some of these things um, that that over the year I, I, my thought is to maybe put together a, a series of lectures and and uh, presentations uh, for handlers, trainers, and veterinarians who might have an interest in this. So I appreciate you taking the time to watch this. And if you have any questions, please send me an email, uh, caninecare at sportsvet.com, and I'd be happy to uh, uh, tr try and work with you on it. Thanks so much.